Hi, brothers and sisters. We're going to take a quick look at horses in the scriptures and see what we can uh, figure out by what is gave to us when we determine to search it out with the Holy Spirit guiding us in the pathway of a desire to want to know the truth. If we just go in thinking we already have it, uh, it doesn't really leave the Holy Spirit much to work with. So here's what I was reading. We're going to go to Isaiah. Got a hair in my mouth there. Isaiah 31, 3. And I'm questioning something here. I just thought of it. But Isaiah 31, verse 3 says, But the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Now, in your other translations, most of them's going to say men. Uh... Humans, they'll say. Um, the word for God here is L. And from my understanding, based on this theology that the Spirit has been teaching us, that term L identified the feminine. That's what it identified. And, and it adds up. It lines up. With what I'm about to, to show you in the other passages, it says, but the Egyptians are more mere mortals. Actually, maybe, possibly, not men. I think it should almost be rendered women because of the passage that I'm going to read. But the Egyptians are mere women and not God. The horses are flesh and not spirit. So we're, we're getting the allegory of a horse to the spirit. But you got to understand that these armies, if we're understanding it properly, was women. The host consisted of women on horseback. And we are going to get that understanding with Shulamite. And yet she's identified as the power. Um, and so let me explain. Here we go. It says, but the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. And when the Lord stretches out, not his hand, her hand, those who help will stumble, and those who are helpers will fall. All will perish together. Okay. So, having read that, we know she's the great help. So she's helping who? Well, she's supposed to help him. So based on that, then the Egyptians are mere men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. So we are talking about, we're not talking about the nation of Israel because they were considered God upon this earth. And it was through the spirit. It says the only way to approach me is through the spirit. You cannot approach God any other way because the Spirit is God. So I'm just thinking out loud here. Because let's go here and read this verse real quick. Song of Songs 1 9. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. A mare. So we're getting a horse there. We backtrack here, but the Egyptians are mere mortals and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out her hand, those who help will stumble. Where did they stumble? Where did the horse stumble, you think? Well, when I saw that, it took me to... Oh, where is it? Genesis 49, 17. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heel so that its rider tumbles backward. So the horse is identified as female. Yeah. Because of what we read in Song of Songs 1-9, I have likened thee, my darling, to a mare 
among Pharaoh's army. Then we have the Egyptians are mere mortals, not God. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. And when the Lord stretches out her hand, the helper will stumble. So we see the stumble here in Genesis 49. We also understand that Dan was the downfall for the daughters, according to what we read in, I had it pulled up, where is it? Ah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, ha I was doing this study early this morning and I really didn't get the chance to put all the effort into it that I really needed to. Um, where is it? Is that it? Let me see here if this is the passage I'm looking for. Okay. So it's going to be difficult. Oh, nope, here we go. Okay, here we go. Micah chapter 1. What does it say in verse 13? Harness the horses to the chariot, you residents of Lachish. Now, Lachish, to my understanding, was in the territory of Dan. This was the beginning of sin, who got struck on the heel by a viper. Right? Something's going on here. This was the beginning of sin for daughter Zion, because Israel's acts of rebellion can be traced back to you. Look at that. There's something large going on here in this picture. So where else do we get a sting, a bite, a piercing? We find that, if it's here, I had to leave so quick. Um, did I get it pulled up here? Let me see, right there. What does it say in Genesis 3.15? And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. She, it's not he, she will crush your head and you will strike her heel. So again, that takes us back to Genesis 49, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It does in my opinion. Maybe not in yours. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its riders tumbles backwards. Now, we examined other passages, such as the one in Lamentations 4, uh, verse 1. And when we went in and really looked at all those words, we identified um, that they were actually mur murdering their mothers, who were wisdom on the cornerstones of, or on the corners of the city streets is what it, it kind of sounds like. Um, and they were called uh, the holy uh, stones. And um, then by verse 3, we see the daughters behaving in this horrible manner and not raising her children up in the manner that she ought to be doing because they had murdered the mod mothers because the sons rejected their teachings. They didn't want them is what we come to understand, because the sons are identified as being like gold in the beginning, and then they just come down to nothing more than the value of clay pots. So this is all linked to what was going on in Lachish, which was Dan. Now Dan bordered other nations, from my understanding, outside nations, and so it made Dan easily susceptible, or m possibly more susceptible, to outside influences. Though we also saw them um, going astray out in the wanderings, which we've looked at. All right, so where else do we go um, to kind of link some thoughts here together? This isn't necessarily a clear study so much as a heads up of something that uh, if you want to study it and look at it, we know that there's a lot going on here. We can see it. But what does God say to the one that put her spirit in Moses. That's what's to be understood in Isaiah 63. 
And we go back to horses. And God says there, my footprints weren't seen because the waters, that's the admixture of doctrine of the Red Sea, covered over my footsteps and they were never seen. You didn't see them, she says. And we know it's her. We identified it as she in other uh, studies that we've done. But when we go here, um, where is it? Verse 11. So Isaiah 63, verse 11, we're going to hit the horse again. Then she remembered the days of old, Moses and her people, saying, Where is she that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of her flock? And where is she that put her Holy Spirit within him? So that this is to say that Moses was willing to hearken to the spirit of the daughter of Israel. That's what he was hearkening to. And he was allowing her spirit to teaching the laws of God, which are these, ten, it begins with these Ten Commandments, and then we see what the Sabbath day is supposed to look like in Isaiah 58. So, verse 12, that led them by the right hand of, this is Moses, with her glorious arm, dividing the waters before them to make herself, that's right, daughter Israel was there to make an everlasting name for herself, the Spirit was. And verse 13, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. So we're getting the idea that this glorious host that came from heaven were women on horses. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. And even the Egyptians possibly had women on horses. Although, in many of the passages, it does render it as men. But since we know God on earth was identified as the women in the nation of Israel, is it possible the Egyptians was also had an army of women? Um, or was it opposite to that? Was it men on horses, as it indicates? So we're just looking at some things here. And trying to connect them. Because um, we do so get the understanding that she is the power. Now, we already looked at the jackass with Balaam. And it specifies that the jackass carrying the burden is female. And we see her being yoked and going into bondage. So what we get is the allegory in Isaiah 46 of this. Bel, bel, down, me, boo, stupid. Their idols were upon the beasts. And upon the cattle, your carriages were heavy loaded, they are a burden to the weary beasts. So what it's saying here is you women are exalting an idol on your back and you're literally carrying it. Which then we see him exalting the harlot spirit in his heart, right? Which exalts him. So we're getting all of this understanding that the great power that allows the idol to stand in many ways is women themselves. They are the power of the body. They were also the power to defend man from what was wrong. And we also see him rejecting that. So just like in plan on planet Earth, you'll see uh, many going this way, many going that way, many going this way, many going that way. And there's many different perspectives. So too in the Bible. Um, the breakdown came through a multitude of ways it did. Uh, when you get studying uh, these different passages. Um, but it definitely, to me, looks as if the power of the body to defend was women. In Numbers 20, 22, we get Balaam speaking to a donkey who's trying to protect him. She's got him lifted up. She's carrying the burden of Baal, Balaam. We, we understood where the idol of Baal comes from. It's your husband exalted as Lord and God. Yeah. So Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the way that bites a horse's heels so that its riders tumble backwards. So you wonder, is this taking us possibly out into the wanderings? Um, did the first contamination come in to Dan, uh, to the tribe of Dan, um, who 
was at the back of the camp. Uh, when we see the breakdown of the camp in Numbers 2, Dan was always the rear guard. That's what we see. Um, and Dan was always in the back. So, and we know that this was a massive moving camp. It was huge. And so it wasn't this tiny little camp that we have in our idea that when this contamination happened, well, just pass from this one to this one. This was a massive camp. It would have took a long time for that contamination that began in Dan, although we got the name Lakish there as if it's settled, um, that would have moved through from Dan and contaminated all of Israel, which would have been Balaam sending in, telling Balak, go get the women from your nations to go in to seduce the men so that they can contaminate the women inside of Israel. So we see the contamination actually beginning in, it says, Lakish. So it's all connected. It's amazing, isn't it? Really, when we get looking at it. Again, harness the horses to the chariot, you residents of Lakish. So they did so reside there. This was the beginning of sin. For the daughter of Zion, because Israel's acts of rebellion can be traced to you. So we do see them contaminating the woman's seed with a religious lie upon their tongue, as and the religious lie is man as God, your bridegroom, your husband, Lord and God. We also studied Jeremiah 23, which also tells us the same thing that the men began to prophesy through themselves, through he, the he pronoun. It says it right in there. Um, let's see, what else do we got that I didn't want to forget? Um, I know I had more thoughts on it. Job 39. Now, uh, let's see. We'll go to the horse here. Um, God is speaking about God's creation. And God says, Has thou given the horse strength? Has thou clothed the neck with thunder? They got he. Because there's no female horses. There's actually no females of anything. <laughs> if you listen to the men of Baal. Which the women of this world do. And they think obedience is love. Right? Well, not the wrong kind of obedience. That's not love. If we had the covenant of God in the land, this world would not be on fire right now burning. And I mean that literally. This world is being devastated by a multitude of uh, disasters going on. And because our own little backyard is peaceful, uh, we think that that's the norm, that's the... That's the standard for the globe, and it is far from the standard for the globe. The globe is in, up, in upheaval. The world is in upheaval. The earth is in upheaval. Um, and yet there's ideas that if we truly were listening to God, that the power of that truth is so powerful um, that by now it should have spread across the globe and saved really all of us from these disasters that are taking place on a daily basis, and it has not. And you can say, yeah, but it prophesies it. No, it does not prophesy it. The Old Testament prophesies that the world cannot receive the spirit of truth and reject it or in the beginning as the cornerstone and foundation. And we're told that the day of the Lord is concerning the controversy of Zion. The controversy of Zion was about splitting the pleasant land identified as the women in Israel into two covenants, one a harlot that bows to man as God, and the other that became the outcast that no man sought a covenant with. And then they say that, oh, this is the covenant of God that's in the land. No, it is not. If it was, we would all be saved right now. That's how powerful God's truth is. You run it down and say it doesn't have the power. All it does is really have the power to lead to destruction and judgment from God. That's the lie in the land. You have been obedient to an idol built up by your husband, putting a yoke on your neck, and you are the power of the body. 
that are carrying and lifting up Baal. That's what you're doing. You're carrying a burden upon you, an idol upon you. And you won't wake up from that because you think pat pat on your head is a good thing. Bowing to an idol is never a good thing to God. It's a very, very bad thing. And it will bring on judgment. And to say husband was so clean and wifey was so filthy that she had to literally wash in his blood. Blood stains. It's water that washes you. And we're told that that water was supposed to flow from his first wife, who he rejected in covenant. He didn't want her water. Where what we've been washed in blood, you clean? Are you clean? God says, I'll send you water to wash in. I'll send you blood to drink. That's what you want. That's what you'll get. You can bow to an idol all you want. There's no truth found in it that will save you. So, God talks about God's creation. Has thou given the horse strength? Has thou clothed the neck with thunder? Can you make the horse afraid as a grasshopper and the glory of its nostrils is terrible? It paweth in the valley and rejoices in its strength. It goeth on to meet the armed men. It mocketh at fear and is not affrighted and neither turneth back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against the body of the horse and the glittering spear in the shield. It swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage and neither believeth that it is the sound that and neither believeth that it is the sound of the trumpet that it cannot stand still at the trumpet sound. When the trumpet blasts, it snorts defiantly and smells the battle from a distance. It hears the officers shout and the battle cry. Does the hawk take flight by your understanding and spread its wings to the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and make its nest on high? Okay, we got nest, its nest here. But we don't have it for a horse. We have the gender specified he. With the eagle here in King James, we've got, does the eagle mount at the command and make her nest on heart? Now, in the other translations, you know what they render it? His. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on heart? Right. Yeah. So she dwelleth and abideth on the rock upon the crag of the rock and the strong place from thence she seeketh the prey and her eyes behold afar off her young ones also suck up blood and where the slain is there she is also so some translates the eagle all male 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 we know that the king of babylon mounted himself up to the high places we see the sight uh, likened to a dragon. A dragon was said to have keen eyesight and was able to see great distances. So I think we're looking at, um, you know, like understanding a plan is what I think we're actually looking at. And so the one that must take him out also must understand the plan. And that's why God says, who can understand what took place from beginning to end? And so when we go up on the horse here, what does it say? Um, she is hardened against her young ones as though they were not her own. Her labor is in vain without fear. So she births the children, but she goes, Ah, they're not known by my name, they're known by his. I'm teaching what he tells me to teach, what the idol tells you to teach. Because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither has she imparted to her her understanding. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and its rider. So, we get the harlot in covenant with fallen Adam. Right? That's what we get. Yeah. So we do so understand in many of these passages that, that the, horse, the horse was the power, the strength, 
And it carried, I believe, in the very beginning, it was a host of women. That's what it was. And um, the, the men didn't want their protection, even though the, they chose a branch um, to be in covenant with, and they guided them through the sad mixture. Um, there's also the idea that the women stood in Israel amongst um, these um, armies. Um, they had to be because they are the ones identified as the ones that led Israel out. So I don't know if you know what I'm saying there. Right? It's amazing. what they won't study and look at and refuse to teach because they want you subservient to their lie. And the way this covenant of lies works is if you exalt that and bow to this idol and say, he, he, he is God, 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 then you have to shut your mouth. Yeah, because it also tells you to shut your mouth because the shepherd, he is going to lead. So you really have no... Uh, wiggle room there. You either believe the covenant. You can't take just parts of it that suits you. Um, you have to take it all. So that means being silent, shutting your mouth, and getting the little pat on your head, and building hubby up and carrying him on your back, just like it says in Isaiah 46. That's your covenant that got established in the land. You're building hubby up. Bell bow down, nibu stupid. They're idols. So we know Baal is Baal. And we see Balaam on the she-ass. And she's actually trying to save him. God says at some point I'm going to cut the burden away and they'll no longer be responsible to deliver you. The ones that actually wake up. Uh, they stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. The women who could deliver the children, that's right, went into captivity. They could not deliver the burden. And what does it say? She says, long time have I carried you. She says, I carried you. I'm the one that's carried you all this time. And daily, Psalm 68, I have carried these burdens upon me so that you would continue to have the chance at salvation. Where is that? I'm going to lose power here. Psalm 68, because I didn't plug in. Psalm 68 tells us that she is the one that daily carries the burden. Well, we know it's women that carry children. They're carrying the burden. They're delivering the children. But they're just busy listening to hubby saying, Nah, we're not the one that teach. Well, you are the ones. They were to expect to receive your instructions when they made a covenant with you. And they perjured themselves in the courts of heaven is what we're told. But in Psalm 68, where's the verse? It says, daily the Lord carries the burden. Daily. So we get all this understanding. Verse 19, blessed be the Lord. That's 136. That is daughter Israel's number, the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits. Even the God of our salvation. That's feminine 3444, four, four, your deliverer. So it says, loadeth us with benefits, but go in and render the other translations of it. Let's do that before I leave. So Psalm 68, parallel chapters. Let's see. And it was verse what? 19, 18, 19. We'll see what other translations give here. 19, it says this, and then I'll have to leave. Praise be the Lord to God our Savior who daily bears our burden. Gee, I wonder who that is. Oh, he, he, he. It was his um, good will to deliver us through his truth. Deliver in that passage is birth. Ah, uh, no, it's this Lord that births you in all truth. It's this Lord that washes you with her water. It's this Lord that gives you milk 
to survive and she's the one that is daily bearing the burden. And we're told that now in Isaiah 46 she went into captivity because she was carrying a burden upon her back. Man, that's what she was doing. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. So we're seeing the burden on the women. We're the ones that carries the burden, do we not, in our womb? Do we not? You don't see that? No, he's carrying it all. The burden we're talking about is the deliverance of the children. And that is why the Red Sea is identifying an ad mixture of doctrine. And that must be parted with the sword, this double-edged sword. But it's also allegorical to a birthing canal that opens up when we are able to part the lies. That's right, the lies from the true covenant and open up the birthing channel. And it closed up because this admixture of lie that hubby put to our lips because it tickled his ears. It was like honey on his tongue, but it's wormwood in his stomach. It's killing us. Yeah, can't see that. Oh, the house is on fire, but hey, this is all, this is all you've ever been taught. We go astray from the womb. And we listen to the lies instead of picking our head up and saying to the only God that can lead us into any truth, not him on the pulpit, but the true living God and listen to the Spirit lead us into all truths by hard study, if need be. Which is what the New Testament says, study to show thyself approved unto God, not unto a man. It says unto God. And then, you saw no image of me, make no image of me, God says in Deuteronomy 4. You were to receive my Ten Commandments, which you rejected. So, we see everything lining up to the truth. But nobody wants to go in and study. I say nobody. There's some. I'm sure there's got to be some out there. Um, it's not easy. Yeah, coming away from a brainwashing. It's not easy. But that's how you are to be transformed, by the renewing of your mind. That means change the way you think. Wisdom says fools love foolishness. The blind leads the blind. And yet God says reason my truth so they make sense. They're not stupid. And this one don't make no sense. Three males. He gives life. Why now do I see every man standing around with his hands on his hips as a woman in travail and every face turned pale? He don't give life. She does. She's the one carrying the burden, and she's been carrying it for a very long time. God says in Isaiah 22, there's going to come a time when I'm going to cut that burden away off her, and she's no longer going to be responsible for delivering you. And that's the warning that Joshua actually gives you. Oh, you can blaspheme me, the son of man, but when she shows up, you're not going to blaspheme her anymore and get away with it. You're not. Because it's her law that rules the land. Get it? Now, I'm also looking at that in a different manner. Um, and we may do a, a little video on that. Um, I know I wasn't supposed to make any more videos, but I really think it's important that the feminine get clearly identified. And she is clearly identified um, in the scriptures for anybody who wants to go in and look at it and put it together. Um, the day of the Lord is not about the escape of a bunch of Christians who bow to a man uh, and, and, and waits to be delivered. <laughs> the birthing canal can only uh, push out by a woman. It, it, it's not a man that does it. It's a woman that does it. And uh, so far, all that's been birthed out of this earth is those who have gone astray from the womb. So I wonder if the child that is caught up in Revelation 12, 12 um, isn't her firstborn daughter, which I said it is. It's just I'm starting to look at it in a very different way than what I used to. I think we have been told a real big pile of crap when it comes to eschatology. And uh, we may take a closer look at that in my, I think it'll be my final video. Um, you know, I'm just trying to show you uh, in a very gradual manner, what that covenant in the very end is going to look like. 
Um, and it doesn't look a thing like the one that we've got established right now in the world. Um, and I keep stressing that, I keep saying that, but we may look at the War Scrolls and uh, put the correct gender on it. And though, um, you know, you can reject, you can blaspheme the Son of Man in this physical existence, uh, this physical existence is preparing us for the battle in the next existence, is what it looks like, and in what side you're going to take. <clears throat> And so when that Lord finally shows up in the second heaven, which has to do where the principality and the powers do rule from, um, mother has birthed her firstborn. And when she shows up, then that's the power showing up. And uh, so there's, there's a different way of looking at it than what we've been taught, just based on the definition of the word eschatology. And um, so I might look at a little video, we might do a little video like that, to do with the War Scroll. Uh, the War Scrolls, <clears throat> which um, they consider non-canon, um, and yet um, there's relevance. There's some very relevant passages that do, does so seem to uh, tie in to various verses in the Holy Bible. So um, I'll leave it there. Uh, sorry I blathered on, uh, you know, and didn't really tie it completely together. I leave it to you um, to look at those who's really interested in looking at those passages and tying it together. But it, she is clearly identified as a great power who has been lifting up man as God in the earth and letting him um, get away with whatever he wants. And God says, uh uh, you have the power to stop that. You always did. Pick your head up. Pick your head up and start understanding who you are. And the, the Shulamite says, um, the son has looked upon me. Uh, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard, but my own I have not kept. It's time we started keeping our own vineyard. And you have the power to do that. So, um, thanks for watching. Pray the Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth. And I hope you all have a really nice day. Thanks.